Okay, good afternoon and welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, if you didn't get a chance, please uh, feel free to grab a slice of pizza or two and um, enjoy your lunch as we welcome our guest speaker today, uh, Jim New. This is another lecture in our annual lecture series, Engaging Pluralism, and particularly uh, poignant today as we welcome a guest, Jim New, who is also a faculty member in our study abroad program in Paris, which is an expression of the school's desire to be pluralistic, to be present both in the city of Houston, but also uh, also more globally. So I'm delighted to uh, welcome him here. I will hand it over to John soon, who will introduce Jim uh, more properly. Uh, but I also want to say that this lecture is also a part of our 20th year celebration of the Rice Architecture Paris program. So it's a very important milestone. Um, we have been invested in a program for a long time and connecting to architects and scholars in the city who really bring exceptional both scholarship and practice to uh, our education and to our students uh, in the Paris program. With that, I'm particularly thankful to John for directing the program uh, for the past, past 20 years and for really uh, positioning for a really uh, great success, both in terms of academic rigor, but also uh, the kind of student experience that it provides. And I'm glad to see some of the students here who participated uh, in the program as well. There is more to come in terms of celebrating the 20th anniversary, but without much more ado, I'll hand it over to John, who will introduce Jim. Thank you, John. Thank you, Igor, and hi, everyone. Um, remember me? Um, th uh, it, it's really a great pleasure to uh, welcome Jim uh, back to the School of Architecture in Houston. Uh, he was here a number of years ago doing research on um, Cedric Price. Um, so I look forward to the lecture today. Uh, Jim is an integral part of the School of Architecture in Paris, um, being one of the, actually, the founding uh, faculty. Um, we knew of Jim through our program in Vico, uh, Morcote, which we started in the um, um, late 90s. And it was actually Michael Morrow who was directing that program who uh, was in contact with you when he brought our students um, on the study trips to Paris. And when we started the program, Ken Fitzsimons had a list of names um, and contacted them to see if they're willing to participate in the program. Um, and Jim was one of them who, without really any kind of knowledge of, of the program, nor any kind of um, um, real kind of um, a curriculum at that point. So Jim is really responsible in many ways for the success of our program through his uh, replaying modernism course, a fresh take on uh, the significance of modern architecture in Paris. And we're really grateful to him for all, all of his efforts. Uh, excuse my voice today, the ragweed has been absolutely uh, terrible. Um, <clears throat> Jim, or Jimmy as he was known when he worked at um, um, OMA, in fact, at the same time as uh, Sarah Whiting, who still insists on calling you Jimmy. Um, but we know him as Jim. He is Canadian, was um, educated at Waterloo, um, and has an, um, a degree from Paris Belleville, but more recently he um, received his PhD from, from Delft um, under Jean-Louis Cohen, and I was privileged to be on his uh, dissertation uh, re as, a, as a reader. Um, he's a, an important figure in Paris, a professor at, um, um, at La Villette, um, the School of Architecture at La Villette. Um, he's also um, uh, been a consultant to the Ministry of Culture um, on many of the um, uh, Grand Paris uh, projects. Um, we're really uh, grateful to have you, and um, uh, thanks for everything you've done over these past 20 years. So I'll give it back to you so we can hear more of what you're working on. Is this okay? You can hear me fine. Um, well, thanks for a wonderful introduction, and it, it is great to be back here. 
um, and especially on such a momentous occasion as the 20th anniversary of the Rice uh, Paris program. Um, it's very nice to see a lot of uh, familiar faces and some new faces, so thanks a lot for this uh, invitation. Um, now, having said that, um, I not only feel uh, uh, my age, maybe, but uh, <laughs> after 20 years, but uh, I think uh, I realize also that uh, some of the ideas that I was able to develop in the, uh, my teaching at Rice are behind um, the research that I'd like to share with you uh, today on uh, the work of the late British architect Cedric Price. So um, that's a kind of a special occasion for me. I think, uh, for example, one fundamental notion that got me interested in Price's work early on um, was that of uh, process. Um, and the idea of process is, of course, nothing that process matters is nothing particularly maybe astonishing when it comes to design or to building. But at the time, I was really interested to explore how that could be applied more to architectural discourse and to, you could say, the production of architectural theory, how um, the process if we spent more attention or more imagination devoted to the process of discussing and communicating architecture um, could be uh, quite interesting and not just what um, was being discussed but how we discuss architecture. So th this is a little bit uh, about what uh, I would like to talk about today uh, with respect to the work of Cedric Price. Um, my talk, as you see, is um, titled The Architecture of Continuous Dialogue. And this is with reference to uh, Price, who once um, characterized the essential role of architecture as uh, creating a continuous dialogue. Now, uh, Price often liked to, to play with words. He, was, he once said that uh, words are beautiful things. And he often spoke in uh, neologisms and riddles to keep his public um, somewhat on their toes, so to speak. Um, but it was not really about driving home um, uh, absolutely to his point of view. It was more about cultivating uh, critical and creative thinking as a way to kind of broaden the possibilities of architecture. And so uh, in the next, let's say, 30, 40 minutes, I'd like to uh, try that and in the process uh, uh, maybe um, unpack uh, a little bit some of the meaning and, and the ways that Price attempted to create uh, what he called a continuous dialogue. So um, let's start with this uh, revealing self-portrait of uh, Cedric Price, taken sometime in the 1990s, um, and in which Price uh, playfully inscribes um, in a cartoon thought bubble just above his head uh, the following statement, wish we were here. Um, by dropping the I and replacing uh, the you with uh, we, in other words, wish we were here instead of I wish you were here, um, Price emphasized and expanded uh, the collective meaning of his uh, message. Price's quote-unquote uh, wish as both a kind of personal reflection and uh, a kind of, I would say, a kind of battle cry was a plea for more civic cooperation, um, for a greater sense of community. And uh, wish we were here uh, speaks not only of Price's project for uh, architecture, but his project for society. Now, Price is most often remembered um, as the architect of such seminal projects as the Fun Palace or the Pottery's Think Belt. However, he was also uh, highly influential as a journalist, as a writer, a critic, um, educator, researcher, and uh, intellectual. And today I'd like to focus a little bit more on these, uh, let's say, discursive activities um, while keeping in mind that um, Price was always challenging this uh, traditional distinction between what is, uh, let's say, discourse on the one hand and what is design. And this uh, creative entanglement between theory and design, I think, um, that was really at the heart of Price's work, I think is uh, particularly relevant given the theme of this uh, lecture series about engaging pluralism. So um, here is another revealing self-portrait, you might say, an office memo pertaining to the Fun Palace project. And when Price slightly modifies his letterhead to read Cedric Price, anti-architect number one. Um, now, if the term anti-architect has uh, lent itself to numerous explanations, um, the formulation anti-architect number one uh, has never attracted much attention. 
yet it is clear that by adding um, number one, there is an introduction of a critical touch of humor and self-mockery that uh, otherwise uh, the statement would be perceived perhaps as a paradoxical sign of megalomania. On the contrary, anti-architect number one, um, as in public enemy number one, which was a term that was popularized in the US in the 1930s and forever has become associated with American popular culture, is a sign of Price's deeply pop-influenced uh, conception of architecture. So for the first part of my talk, I'd like to talk or examine, re-examine a little bit more closely what I would define as Price's cultural agenda. So Price's first uh, public statement on architecture was entitled The Motivation of Culture. So on the 10th of April, 1958, in collaboration with his friend and co-worker, Bill Coburn, Price gave an illustrated talk in the avant-garde setting of uh, the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, which had previously hosted such groundbreaking events as the, uh, for example, exhibition Parallel of Life and Art, uh, curated by uh, Nigel Henderson, Eduardo Palazzi, and the Smithsons uh, in 53, or Rainer Banham's lecture on futurism, which sent, laid the foundations for his seminal history of uh, uh, theory and design in the first machine age, or the exhibition um, Man, Machine, and Motion, curated by Banham and uh, artist uh, Richard Hamilton in 55. Now, Price was only 23 years old. Um, in a letter to ICA deputy director and uh, pop theorist Lawrence Alloway, who chaired the event, uh, Price expressed his desire, quote unquote, to bring down the prestige barriers of power groups, or what he called also group attitudes, and their elitist appropriation of architectural imagery in order to promote a more inclusive vision of architecture open to a variety of lifestyles. What Price was essentially um, seeking to do was to define what could be an architectural equivalent uh, to the nascent British pop art scene at the time. Not surprisingly, in his very first studio assignment the following year, as a part-time tutor at the A, who was, he uh, was the youngest ever uh, tutor to be hired by uh, the Architectural Association School in London, Price proposed the design of a supermarket, a hybrid supermarket building um, based on the hypothesis that the future of shopping could contribute to the definition of a new civic building type, uh, one that would be emblematic of a new uh, model of social welfare with provisions of wide range of products, uh, a cafe, a pharmacy, as well as domestic accommodation for the manager, uh, the assistant, the pharmacist, all housed in the same complex. So a kind of very symbolically charged uh, programmatic brief for his students. The publication of the results, which you see here, um, was titled The Super Moro, was Price's first architectural article, and marked the beginning of his architectural practice, 1960. Significantly enough, it was not published in an architectural magazine, but in the British Design and Industries Association yearbook. The title was clearly a nod to the legendary proto-pop exhibition, This is Tomorrow, held at the Whitechapel Art Gallery in 1956, and on which Price had worked on as an assistant. And here's a view of the installation. Now, by the end of the 1950s, Price had effectively assimilated the theories and the concepts of pop art and culture and developed a close working relationship with many of the leading figures such as Alloway, I mentioned previously, Banham, or Richard Hamilton, whose iconic pop collage you see here. Now, I would argue that it is possible to read uh, Price's early design work uh, through the lens of the development of pop art. For example, Price's diploma project at the AA, which he uh, completed in 1957, corresponds to what Alloway defined as the first phase of pop art which was largely figurative and drew directly on mass culture, uh, material like American color uh, print magazines. Now there's an amusing anecdote um, told by Price about his uh, final diploma review. Apparently, according to Price, Peter Smithson was invited as an external uh, jury member and uh, Price was the first to, to, to present. Uh, after taking one look at Price's project, um, Smithson uh, cried out, uh, 
I thought this was a bloody architecture school, not an advertising agency, and he stormed out of the room. Now, of course, Price um, does much better impersonation of uh, Peter Smithson, um, but what Price failed to mention, however, is that the Smithsons were also closely and actively engaged in the exploration of popular culture. At the time, notably as a, members of the independent group, especially in the first phase of pop art, one could say, and that they celebrated for their, their celebrated essay, but today we collect ads, published in 1956, had a notable impact on Price's generation. Later work, such as the Fun Palace, which you see here, can be interpreted as belonging to what Alloway called, uh, defined as the second phase of pop art, and which emerges at the end of the 1950s, which is more programmatic rather than figurative. This phase is less explicit in its sources and consists of an effort to align, for example, uh, different uh, tendencies in abstract art with, quote unquote, the common everyday experience, especially the urban experience of mass media. For instance, this early um, conceptual sketch of the Fum Palace bears a strong resemblance to the Eames-inspired uh, exhibition installation um, an exhibit, which you see here, of 1957, which was the fruit of a collaboration between Lawrence Alloway, Richard Hamilton, and British constructivist artist uh, Victor Passmore, and described by the authors as, an, uh, I quote, game slash artwork slash environment to be played, viewed, and populated. What I want to stress here is that, in fact, the ICA supported a wide range of competing artistic tendencies, which also overlapped and cross-fertilized, uh, like this encounter between pop art and abstraction, and that this expansionist vision of art, um, which was also very anthropologically grounded, for example, Lawrence Alloway often spoke in terms of human activity. This pluralistic vision um, is very present in the work of Price. However, Price's direct engagement with pop culture, um, or the pop culture scene in London at the end of the 50s, was preceded by his own personal engagement with mass culture and mass media during his youth. For instance, Price developed a childhood passion for scrapbooks, which he filled with press cuttings uh, from all the British uh, dailies, compiling selected articles according to various themes, which would continue to be themes that he worked on as an architect. Um, many themes, for example, uh, like this one, um, entitled Famous Homes of England for which new uses are being found. Furthermore, Price was not content uh, to be just an avid reader or a quote-unquote knowing consumer. He also edited his very own popular uh, magazine in which he combined uh, crime uh, fiction serials with news, jokes, fun facts, quizzes, interviews, and practical commentary. He was only uh, um, 13 years old. And what is especially interesting is that the material that Price collected in the scrapbooks from newspapers and popular literature fed his writing and publication projects, a method that Price would continue to develop in his activity as an architect. For example, one of his most intriguing Scrapbooks was devoted to local homicide investigations, which Price painstakingly followed through the press like a young detective in a nonfiction crime thriller. Indeed, Price's crime uh, digest was not your typical collection of detective fiction for young children, but a hybrid experiment combining local crime news and history with fictional and non-fictional crime stories. This practice of mixing fictional and non-fictional elements, in other words, storytelling and news reporting, and collecting material from a wide range of sources, would become a salient feature of Price's future work as an architect. In April 1970, for example, Price published this four-page scrapbook of cuttings collected during a recent trip to the US under the title Cedric Price, US Snoop, April 1970. Price's eclectic sources range from local newspapers and magazines, such as the New York Post, Village Voice, TV Guide, Fortune Magazine, Mechanics Illustrated, to more specialized technical literature, like the specifications of 
Underwriters Laboratories Incorporated, uh, an international nonprofit uh, testing laboratory uh, for safety analysis. And scrapbook uh, topics also varied uh, widely from environmental news to educational technology to uh, autonomous dwelling. Price also added personal annotations and captions here and there, not to mention the odd joke and brain teaser, recalling the comic digest uh, he had edited as a teenager. Now, the article represented an important turning point in Price's architectural discourse. Although he had made ample use of scrapbooks uh, in his architectural practice, not to mention in his youth, documenting, investigating various topics uh, related to his project, he had never explicitly referenced this uh, work in his theoretical articles, that is to say, in a more figurative manner, like a, a kind of journalistic diary of sorts. Um, so for the first time, you have this kind of synthetic, um, polyphonic kind of uh, synthesis of different pop sensibilities coming into his discourse. Um, and this private passion for scrapbooks, um, that it should suddenly reveal itself in an article <clears throat> entitled uh, U.S. Snooping, uh, in other words, U.S. Investigative Reporting, uh, was surely no coincidence given uh, the central role that American sources had played in the emergence of British pop art, and especially in the iconic collages of artists like uh, I just mentioned, Palazzi, John McHale, Richard Hamilton. Like his self-proclaimed um, title, Anti-Architect Number 1, Price's U.S. scrapbook reaffirmed his identification with the Americanism of his early pop formation. Now, Another uh, important influence, however, or source in Price's uh, popularization of architectural discourse was his friend, the journalist, writer, and politician Tom Dryberg, uh, who is notably um, renowned to be the founder of the modern gossip column. Now, these are a couple of his uh, celebrity gossip columns from the 30s and 40s. Dryberg had a unique talent for moving back and forth between uh, genteel chit-chat an incisive commentary on social and political issues. Um, for example, he introduced um, Labour Party figures into, uh, who had, whose origins uh, sharply contrasted with the kind of uh, Mayfair uh, socialites who often graced these kind of uh, traditional gossip columns. And although the, the popular journalism of Dryberg um, was quite removed, you could say, from the artistic circles of pop art, it was no less uh, fit to be included in what pop theorists um, had defined as the world of quote-unquote expendable art. Significantly enough, the majority of Price's writings was as an architectural colonist. Price ran nine successive columns, sometimes in multiple intervals, for two different London-based architectural journals over a period of 25 years. Here you see one of Price's first columns in building design, uh, which was not strictly speaking an architectural magazine, but more or rather a building news and trades journal addressed more broadly to the UK building industry. Unlike artistic, the artistic and intellectual lineage of experimental little magazines like Archigram or AD, to which Price also contributed, um, British trade journals um, like Building Design identified themselves with a very different model of print culture, but one which was perfectly coherent with Price's um, theoretical and ideological ambitions, uh, namely the tabloid, which was a, something of a hybrid between newspaper and magazine and which came to epitomize the British popular press. Indeed, for Price, Price argued that these uh, Trades journals like Building uh, Design was ba were basically gossip papers, he, quote unquote, or he said there was something along the lines of a radio architectural, uh, you know, architectural radio program like Women's Hour. Now, Women's Hour is a BBC radio program uh, which consists of reports, uh, debates, uh, interviews, as well as light entertainment, usually uh, fiction, um, broadly des um, principally uh, directed to women. So I'll let you imagine what that could mean for a. Uh, building industry tabloid. But another important feature to keep in mind in Price's um, writing or his output as a columnist is the frequency. Price's columns came out on a regular uh, weekly basis um, compared to, let's say, the more irregular or monthly kind of longer interviews of professional architectural periodical writing or uh, not to mention academic journals or in uh, experimental magazines. So, this is quite interesting, this engagement uh, in the 
something closer to, let's say, Newsweekly. What is interesting in the case of Price is that he treated these columns as a form of serial literature. In the tradition of literary journalists like Charles Dickens, who was his favorite author, who throughout his career published his novels in monthly or weekly episodes. For example, in the mid-1950s, Price began his third weekly column, um, which you see here, um, entitled Starting Price, which he devoted entirely to letter correspondence. Jim, did you mean to advance the slide? Or? Oh, sorry, yes. Okay, thanks. As Price's editor, uh, Paul Finch, recalls, no one ever wrote in, um, but Price, in fact, invented all the questions himself. So in fact, in this sense, Price's correspondence column was a kind of fictional dialogue in which he published the, initials, the published initials of the correspondent's names and their simplified street addresses. For example, you see here PC 49 Downing Street, function like clues in a detective novel. Fictional dialogue like uh, as a literary genre was a way for Price to develop a greater proximity with his readers and to engage them more actively in the discursive process. It also allowed him to access or to broaden the scope of architectural debate by accessing a, a wider range of uh, personalities with whom normally he could not uh, exchange views, uh, or at least not publicly. Price also posted amusing uh, questions and requests addressed to his readers, which again reached beyond a narrowly um, defined specialist audience. One line of correspondence which ran through the entire duration of this column involved the search to track down the mold of a mold maker of a cast iron boot scraper that Price had purchased in the unlikely form of an existing 19th century English abbey, which you see here, or a, a sketch of Price, a joking hint at his somewhat uh, irreverent uh, attitude to both religion and uh, historical preservation, but also a metaphor for his recurring emphasis on the usefulness um, of architecture, which he advanced as a kind of critique of formalist tendencies. In addition, uh, the rarity of boot scrapers, Price's uh, clever uh, kind of inquiry brought to light, uh, it was a kind of reminder of a largely forgotten aspect of urban history, namely um, footpaths and the pedestrianization, pedestrianization sorry, of the modern city. The fashion of strolling about the city in uh, late 18th century Europe and the emergence of a new social class of pedestrians gave rise to an industry of boot scrapers, which eventually became obsolete due to changes in transportation technology, road paving, and urban sanitation. In other words, the shift from horse-drawn carriage to mechanical vehicles. In his last series of columns published at the end of the 1990s entitled Price Cuts, and you see a, a few pages here, Price again selected and assembled various cuttings from a wide range of sources, suggesting again possible connections from um, seemingly disparate phenomena. Here Price blurs the distinction between uh, quote unquote impersonal voice of the press and his personal commentaries, which now assume the form of headlines, short texts, not just captions, again, pushing further uh, to a new level of complexity, the limit between fact and fiction. The final series also represents an interesting synthesis between pop montage and popular um, journalism, or what I have also uh, kind of referred to as the figurative and the uh, programmatic aspects of pop art and culture. So how did these activities um, impact or relate to Price's architectural projects, per se? To answer this question, let's consider what is probably Price's most discussed uh, project, and certainly his most controversial and personal work, The Potter's Think Belt. For those who are not familiar with the project, basically it consisted of a self-initiated study, that is, without a client, to develop a regional university network um, linking higher education, technical education, and industry, um, which at the same time uh, functioned as a kind of large-scale urban uh, regeneration strategy for the declining industrial region of the Potteries, um, where Price grew up, and uh, which was once the heart of the uh, British ceramics industry. Now, one of the features of the project, which remains relevant today, was the idea to reuse the abandoned railway and industrial infrastructure as part of this new, uh, say, regional uh, university 
campus and to connect the development of the uh, future facilities, including housing, to the redevelopment of the various towns in this post-industrial region. As it has often been um, noted, the Pottery's Think Belt, again, was not published initially in an architectural magazine, but in this uh, social affairs weekly, New Society, the cover that you see here, which had a broader readership than the traditional architectural press and the ability to engage in a more far-ranging uh, far social and cultural debate. New Society was a follow-up to the highly successful New Scientist magazine, which uh, aimed to make science more accessible to the general audience, and uh, New Society attempted to do the same for social sciences and current affairs. However, the, the Paris Think Belt became public before its publication in New Society, that is, before 1966. In 1964, Price organized um, a public discussion on new ways of teaching together with Peter Laslett, you see here, Cambridge professor. And the discussion was led uh, in the context of uh, uh, a discussion at the AA School in London and quickly reported, you see in the article in the middle, in the Times Educational Supplement two days after. So this anonymous uh, article titled Provocatively Naughty Land Atmosphere, question mark, gave an outline of the main issues, but it also pre presented Price's project, quote unquote, for a university of the five towns. Now the five towns was a kind of shorthand for the Potteries region, where the ceramics industry had been concentrated in five uh, industrial towns. Um, so even before it was published in 1966, the project existed in its conception as a discursive idea subjected to public debate. Here I just... The publication in New Society was preceded by other articles in the national press, such as the one you see on the, on the right, um, which was also based on, as in New Society, on Cedric Price's Think Belt report. In fact, Price edited a kind of a resume report, which he sent out to newspapers as well as universities and different institutions. And uh, another very interesting feature of the report is that he included uh, pay, uh, newspaper cuttings and clippings of articles which would become the basis for all these other articles. In a way, um, the Think Belt report was like a kit of cards to, to borrow Price's uh, terminology that he used for the Fun Palace, basically, which would allow uh, different articles to be assembled, readapted. In fact, these articles were quoted in the press constantly by different, and even if the articles were signed by Price, they were edited based on his report. Um, a week after the public discussion the AA, Price published a set of articles in, uh, summarizing his debate with Peter Laslett and it, uh, amplified it with a survey of, of projects. And this is a practice that Price would continue to uh, develop uh, afterwards. Um, for example, here you see uh, uh, the, the cover of architectural design where Price published in this, uh, a few months after the article in New Society, a more detailed article in architectural design with more plans, more uh, drawings. And uh, one in, uh, a year and a half later, in May 1968, a very timely issue, a guested issue by, uh, on learning, again, opening up the question uh, of his project uh, in a larger survey, this time focused on US and UK examples, but to, to amplify uh, the question again, to put it out into public discussion. Um, the AD uh, issue was also a kind of implicit response um, to uh, uh, a polemic that was triggered by an essay by George Baird uh, entitled La Dimension Amoureuse in Architecture, which was published in a special issue on meaning in architecture and later published as, as a book and co-edited with uh, Charles Jenks, um, in which Baird strongly criticized uh, the Potter's Think Felt for, free, for being uh, overly mechanistic and bureaucratic. Um, what I want to maybe insist, uh, besides this kind of implicit dialogue, was also uh, this conscious, conscious design method where Price was constantly mixing research, theory, and practice. They were constantly linked in a kind of continuous cycle of reflection and critique, um, or what Price would call rethinks and uh, updates. Um, the Think Belt generated several other projects, uh, such as the National uh, School Plan, uh, the PolyArc Network, which Price set up to foster better collaboration between architectural schools in the UK and abroad. And, and this project, for example, Adam, 
which you see here, which was developed in the context of the Design Fit uh, workshop organized by former Rice professor uh, Will Kennedy at Rice in 1967 and devoted to new schools for new towns, and, and I believe you participated as well uh, to, the, sure. to the workshop. Yes. Um, Price continually revisited and worked his architectural projects and generated it in the same way that he constantly uh, uh, developed his, his, his narratives as kind of a writing in progress, coming back to articles, extending them in the same way that his projects were always linked to ideas of life cycles and regeneration. So there's this kind of, a, this kind of correlation between the, the, the form or the kind of way that he would discuss his projects and the content of his projects. For example, in September 1985, Price published this long feature article on building design in which he uh, describes a visit to the city of Stoke-on-Trent in his native region of the Potteries on the uh, occasion of the annual Stoke Garden Festival. And he titles it Fiddling a Sentimental Journey um, after the classic semi-autobiographical novel by Lawrence Stern. And basically, it's the account of a visit written as a kind of continuing autobiographical narrative of an architect who comes 20 years after his project, The Party's Think Belt, to the scene of his former project and reconstructs the original process of thinking through different observations, and he develops uh, a new proposal. And this is very interesting. He imagines a possible green network of uh, garden um, festival sites in continuity with the city, uh, in short, a kind of uh, reinvention of the garden city. So there is this kind of continuing process to, of rethinking and reworking the schemes, even in his articles. Another example of this uh, quote unquote continuous dialogue was the Supercrit series that he devised in collaboration with Samantha Hardingham and Kester Rattenbury at Westminster University. In the autumn of 2003, Price was supposed to present his Think Belt uh, scheme to a panel of guest critics, just like a student uh, it would in a teaching studio situation. So, what unexpectedly became, unfortunately, a uh, a posthumous event, um, nonetheless marked the first of a series of uh, so-called supercrits in which major experimental projects of the last, uh, of the second half of the 20th century were reopened for discussion, uh, putting them back into the live studio crit format. And other um, speakers were uh, Robert Venturi, Disney, Disney Scott Brown on Learning from Las Vegas, or Richard Rogers on the Pompidou Center, or Ram Colas on uh, Delirious New York. So the project was very, uh, let's say, defined in a very liberal manner, and the Pottery's Think Belt was an ideal point of departure, because, not only because it was experimental in terms of its architecture or its urbanism, but also in the way to combine theoretical discourse or with design. So to conclude, I want to just briefly, really quickly, come back to an aspect that I evoked early on about uh, Price's discursive activities, which is his teaching. Now, the question of education, uh, in my opinion, or what Price would call uh, learning, is, in my opinion, one of the most fundamental themes of his entire oeuvre. And although there, a lot of attention has been devoted to his projects on education, like the Pottery's Think Bell, very little attention has been made of Price's own experience of teaching, uh, such as his work as a lecturer or tutor. So I just want to look at a few of these experiences. I mentioned uh, some at the, in the 1950s, the supermarket um, studio. Another important experience with the same ambition to broaden architecture culture, uh, to, let's say, bring down or open up the barriers between group attitudes, um, was Price's uh, teaching in continuing education. In the autumn semester of 1960, when he started his office, Price gave a weekly evening course on modern architecture and town planning in the city of Croydon, Croydon as part of a University of London's continuing education pro, uh, program of extension lectures. So Price spoke to a highly diverse audience composed of school children, teachers, quantity surveyors, property developers, uh, local government officials. And the goal of extension courses is to, quote, offer to any section of the general public an opportunity to widen both their cultural background and their understanding of the modern world. This was very much in sync with uh, Price's aims and his ideals. So the aim was basically critical discussion. And regularly after each lecture, he not only discussed with his students uh, what, they, what, what he spoke about, but he also asked them to uh, submit in writing questions or their concerns about architecture. 
And he kept these in his archives and generated projects from these questions, such as uh, acoustic or comfort or the question of noise, et cetera, et cetera. In Price's view, architecture was a shared responsibility um, requiring that the public play an active role in the field and in defining its direction. And as he noted, and I quote, inherent dangers are worth discussing as we are all responsible for new buildings. So according to Price, this um, shared, let's say, responsibility of architecture was a, a sign of the 20th century, what he called universal patronage. Um, and another interesting uh, feature is that he distinguished uh, his function as both an architect, the teacher, and the lecturer, making a difference and saying that the lecturer was the person who would reestablish contact with a public, a larger public, who are directly or indirectly client figures. Um, now, Price continued to teach intermittent, intermittently at the A after his studio experiences in the late 1950s. For example, in, in the early 1980s, he ran this studio entitled The Exchange as part of a, what he called a two-way consultancy, as he qualified. He proposed his quote-unquote services, somewhat promiscuously, to the staff and students alike who could solicit his expertise uh, once a week on demand, thereby introducing professional protocols, practice protocols, into the academic setting of uh, uh, the AA and just the opposite since studio meetings now could be uh, conducted outside the academic boundaries and function of these negotiations, let's say, between future clients who are at the same time consultants. So there was this, this play with this two-way uh, two process of learning. Now this exchange between theory and practice, so to speak, was reinforced by Price's use of contracts. He gave contracts to his, price, to his students and they were um, asked to define not only their, um, nego um, to negotiate not only their project task, that is the purpose and intentions, but also the means, techniques, and even the criteria of evaluation. And the contract was renegotiated after midterm. Um, and amended and version was then signed again by both parties. So again, this kind of uh, play between uh, professional and kind of academic uh, protocols. Price employs, employed this pedagogic device again in his final studio at the A in the 1990s, um, which was named Task Force, and introduced a few subtle adjustments. Uh, one I wanted to note here, just before the date and signatures, where he requested the student to choose a role to play from a list of four possible figures, the archivist, the chamberlain, the fixer, or the spy. Now, this pedagogic casting was not exclusive to the students. Price also gave a role to his teaching assistant, Takio Muraji, who was a Japanese architect and AA graduate, who Price had solicited based on his thesis research on creative psychology. And Price gave Muraji the pseudonym of the catalyzer. And he encouraged his assistant to consistently disagree with him, or at least propose an opposing or alternative point of view. And in this way, uh, encouraged his students to be more critical. And Muraji recalls, uh, interesting enough also, that he, Price insisted on uh, avoiding the use of the term student uh, and preferred the notion, um, less hierarchical, of member. Uh, you are all members of the, of the task force. And this critical, let's say, cooperative positioning uh, was developed through role playing and dialogue, um, was really a kind of critical part of Price's teaching. Um, the content also was very interesting. For example, just quickly, uh, he launched the task force with a one-month design exercise uh, devoted to the design of unusefulness. And this initial design assignment was then followed up by its contrary, namely the investigation of what he called the architect's responsibility to society, in which the student was asked to reevaluate the first project, and then, so through this kind of opposition, through unusefulness and responsibility, the students became more aware of their presupposed autonomy um, or uh, the uh, unusefulness or usefulness of architecture. And so this kind of figure of the architect or user was therefore not universal but inherently plural and contingent, especially within a societal framework. So Price's AA contracts were not just pedagogic. They, were, um, they had a kind of cultural and political um, dimension as a form of social contract. Um, in a kind of more egalitarian vision of society. So Price not only transformed the kind of, well, let's say, conventional modus operandi of the design studio, but also its modus vivendi. Um, so 
I should conclude um, very quickly maybe to mention that some of the settings were also very important. You can see, for example, sometimes these events um, were important where the setting to go beyond, the, say, the typical uh, confines of the classroom or the studio. Um, this is a, a lecture that Price gave uh, on the occasion of his work on the Oakland Community College project, which was a, a direct also kind of extension of the Rice Design Fed uh, project, Adam. Um, and uh, in the fittingly um, motorized uh, setting of a drive-in theater. But uh, also, um, Price also developed more low-key um, events, yet no less theoretical and theatrical in nature, in which they were again rooted in a kind of pop cultural agenda, I would argue. And uh, Samantha Hardingham, for example, who, uh, whose comprehensive knowledge of Price, Price's work and of Price is unparalleled, recalls a series of uh, uh, improvised lunchtime talks, I thought this would be appropriate to mention, uh, in the AA bar um, during the early 90s when she was a student. And I would like to conclude just with a, a, a short passage which I think is particularly eloquent. Um, I'd like to read. Price noted on more than one occasion that it is the ability to change one's mind that makes us human. The embeddedness of this condition was displayed in real time in a series of lunchtime, lunchtime lectures that Price delivered in the bar at the AA during the early 1990s. No one was expected to stop and be quiet, and they weren't. Rather, lunch service carried on as usual, and the lectures served as a kind of soundtrack to that part of the day. Above the collective chat, Price's voice could be heard providing a running commentary, architecture a cappella, on a variety of current topics and events. Those lucky enough to be passing through picked up as much or as little as was useful to them, eating, drinking, talking, thinking, just the way Price liked it. Now, Miraji, Price's teaching assistant I mentioned, who was also privy to Price's pedagogical aspirations, once asked his senior teaching colleague why he didn't prefer to give his lunchtime talks in the lecture hall where it was uh, typical, uh, not to mention more practical, to do so. And uh, Price responded, but this is more like society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the for the lecture. Really, really sort of fascinating parallel cut through through the life of um, of Price. My question is very very silly, but all along as I was listening to your to your talk, I was thinking that we somehow really are at uh, missing today that type of architect who is a public intellectual who is really committed to being a public intellectual and to cut cut across you know, these different circles of the profession, the discipline, society, etc. And I was wondering if in your mind you can think of examples today who you think could, could somehow match or, or, or echo some of uh, Cedric's appetites for this type of work. <clears throat> I think definitely, um, as far as sometimes uh, it's been mentioned, architect thinkers as kind of maybe public intellectuals, there have been more recently, like uh, Rem Kalas, who was also uh, sometimes published in different contexts, media contexts, which are, let's say, outside. Um, and um, they definitely also did cross at the AA and have a certain mutual respect. So that would be uh, one um, example. Uh, I think there are different dimensions. Uh, for example, Richard Rogers uh, has often um, praised Price's work as being that of uh, his piercing intellect and his uh, ability to transmit concepts and methods to a younger generation. And uh, I think uh, this was also in the context that uh, it was not so much that he was, let's say, a superstar, that, like he was, but that uh, the influence sometimes was through these different avenues that sometimes are not so apparent to the architectural community. Um, some things that I didn't talk about was his work for free um, for education in, uh, for example, um, unemployment, uh, uh, associations uh, for 
for a lot of groups. So the diversity of these groups to which he lectured and to which it seems that he got something out of the feedback, that he, the feedback for him counted. It's true, I think in different ways, um, now this, uh, with the theme also this idea of, of including uh, the community in the process and also in the process of thinking. I think there are a lot of professionals, but at different levels, um, not just the architects, uh, that play a role. And I think maybe to answer your question, maybe it's not just about the architect being a public intellectual. I think the, the, the forms and the spaces of these public engagement have changed now. So we have to look to different um, um, people who maybe uh, are, are playing that role and creating that possible dialogue uh, in different spheres, not, maybe not the same as in the, the time of Christ. Um, following up, so uh, it, it, struck, it struck me throughout the talk that the context of British education, not necessarily the, or the, the context of the British university, not necessarily the AA, which I understand is a very different kind of institution than most British institutions, oh. um, just lends itself to, <laughs> there's a different relationship between the university and society, the university and the public, the university and the government, then it's far less corporate at least then it's become, <laughs> in America, I don't know what my experience is, uh, what the experience is in the early, 50 years ago, but it just, it's a very different kind of place that, that potentially allows these kinds of shenanigans, <laughs> if mm. you want to call it, to take place. And, I, and so I guess I'm, my, and uh, so related to that, I guess I was wondering about the, to what degree do you think he leverages his position, his, his university positions or his teaching positions in his non-university engagements? Well, does he at all? Or, like, how is he... I mean, how is he getting away with sending around reports and getting them published? <laughs> are, they, are, the, are the journalists that are publishing his reports seeing that he's, like, a... he's got a title or, or, he's, or he's associated with some institution that that lends him to do that, or is it just an openness um, to, in, to intellectual ideas that, and, and an unquestioning kind of acceptance of intellectual ideas that wouldn't... Mm. Do you know what I mean? What, what, are the, what are the filters that are kind of in place? Particularly in the earlier work, like in the, in the stuff in the 60s when he's perhaps less established and less well-known. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think um, in the 60s, for example, um, his strategy was to play different roles as the architect, the architect professional, um, and always publishing in uh, different contexts. Um, they could be experimental little magazines, they could be very literary feminist magazines, speaking with a very empathetic uh, anti-architect attitude, saying, uh, um, so he would adapt uh, to his different publics. And this was uh, something he learned, I would say, from Tom Dryberg to not have a, a uniform discourse, but to have uh, multiple publics. So this diversity is definitely something which is not so perceptible. He kind of reverses it in the 70s. What happens is that he brings more of society into the professional community of architecture. The academic community could be the A, but also he broadens at the same time to bring in the trades unions, to bring in the, the building community, to bring all these uh, people who are part of the professional community, and he talks more directly to them. In fact, in reality, he's doing both at the same time, but uh, explicitly there is a, 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 a kind of, um, let's say, a kind of turn, more disciplinary turn, you could say, which I think is very interesting because we, we neglect also that professional um, discourse uh, which is not the, maybe the discourse in academia. Um, and this, uh, this he invested with a lot of vigor and a lot of imagination. So I think he leveraged it uh, in the beginning by simply uh, playing the role of a kind of anti-architect, being uh, a bit uh, uh, contesting the establishment. And he was riding also on the success of the Fun Palace, um, being associated. He was very close to uh, a very strong network, which is the network around the ICA. Uh, and, and these uh, influential circles um, definitely helped him. Um, and they were both his mentors, but also helped him open up this, this network. 
I know we are almost at studio time, but maybe time for one final question, if anybody has one. I have one, but I'm going to hold until maybe I see it. Okay, I'll give it to Danny. Please do. Of course, uh, Cedric was here a number of times, and we loved him as a eccentric personality, and I'm sure John has regaled you with stories about Cedric. But my favorite story, I think we were still students at this time, we loved to hang out at the Athens Bar and Grill up by the Ship Channel. And it was, in those days, this was a, it was on the frontier. I mean, nobody went here except Greek sailors who were in port and architecture students after we discovered it and we just kept going and we loved it. Later it became very popular, but uh, I think we were still students. We, uh, Cedric loved the place and we took him up there a number of times, I think. But one time I remember though we were there, everybody was getting drunk on Retsina and dancing around and um, some bikers came in and Cedric actually befriended one of these bikers and at the end of the evening it was like we were ready to go home and we went outside and we saw Cedric on the back of a motorcycle going down Clinton Drive off into nowhere <laughs> and we, th we thought huh, so are we supposed to wait for him to get back or what you know what is the res extent of responsibility that students have for uh, for a visiting <laughs> professor who's gone rogue? So he didn't come back. I mean, we didn't know what had happened to him, <laughs> but we couldn't actually. I mean, in those days, you didn't think of danger. It was just this was just eccentricity, and you know, the next day he showed up in class just like nothing had happened. <laughs> Thank you. That's Cedric. Thanks, Danny, for sharing. Thank you all for coming. Jim, thank you for a wonderful, thorough talk. We really enjoyed it. So please join me with a round of applause to thank Jim for his participation. Thank you. Thank you.